It's good afternoon, everybody. This is Marla Tori with the Funky Spork. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful Wednesday afternoon. I am with um, my new friend here, a wonderful colleague. His name is Mr. Delta Chant. He is an associate chair and master instructor at the University of South Florida's Religious Studies Department. So we're gonna spend the next few minutes just really getting to know him, know about what he's doing. We're gonna have a nice little chat and really just talk about academics, justice, and the intersections of food justice and food sovereignty. So um, let's get started. But before we um, begin this interview, one question that you were asking me is, who am I and what's my deal and what am I doing? So um, for those of you that maybe aren't as familiar with who I am and what my background is, my background is in um, urban planning and community development and program outreach. So. Um, graduated with my bachelor's degree in um, sociology with an emphasis in urban studies from the University of South Florida and then wound up working in um, nonprofit program coordination particularly within the realms of community arts working for a local community development corporation. I was hungry to learn more so I wound up getting my master's degree in urban and regional planning just because my brain was hungry and I thought you know, what is the best way to get to kind of intersect all my experiences and passions on community outreach, community empowerment, community development, and the arts and creativity. And I thought, you know, urban and regional planning sounds like a really good way to go about it. Flash forward to me successfully completing my master's degree from University of South Florida in urban and regional planning. Wound up um, becoming a planner for the city of Plant City's um, planning and zoning division, formerly as the city of Planner. And then um, throughout that time, I really grew an interest in food, um, culinary arts, and food systems, and food sovereignty, which led me to the creation of the Funky Spork. Flash forward to now, and I've recently jumped ship in order to start this endeavor. So that's who I am, and that's what I'm doing. That's great. Thank you. Very impressive, <laughs> Thank you. Laura. And Thank when you, you shared that with me earlier, I thought, <laughs> well, this is such a wonderful example. Thank you. of how academic background, your education, is really being put to great use Thank in your community to help others. Obviously your professional career uh, as an urban planner and working in government with the city of, of Plant City uh, is clearly a direct deployment of that great educational experience. But then you got really creative and really engaged Thank you. in trying to make a difference in the community, make a difference in the world, and we need, we need more of that. We need folks with your background and your talent, your professional expertise to make a commitment to the local community, to the place where you live, the place that you want to live, the place that you call home. And that's what we're trying to do too that's with great. some of our projects as well. As Amara mentioned, we're in downtown Newport Ritchie, beautiful downtown Newport Ritchie. Um, and Amara had not been here before and she just marveled at the place. And uh, we certainly invite others to yeah. come by beautiful downtown Newport Ritchie and yeah. enjoy the place. This, the place itself is just a wonderful place to be. Yes. You can enjoy an afternoon here at the parks, going to some of the businesses. Sure. Uh, if you enjoy uh, nice beverages, we have some pubs here. Uh, we have a local brewery, the Cody, um, the Cody River Brewery. Uh, we have a local tea shop, um, white hair and uh, a gift and tea shop, um, and just an, an abundance of amenities. For what we really what I really want to focus on, as far as the amenities of Newport Ritchie go, is our community gardens. Oh! Uh, Newport cool. Ritchie was a trendsetter in establishing uh, a community garden ordinance. A community garden ordinance that's now morphed into an urban agriculture ordinance, uh, which allows people to uh, grow fruits, vegetables, produce uh, in, their, in their homes. Anyway, uh, but we really want, we're really excited about the community gardens that we have here. <clears throat> as well as the opportunity for residents of Newport Ritchie to transform their uh, lawns, uh, their properties into food, produ food producing systems. And we've been relatively successful at that through a number of initiatives we've been involved in. So tell us about yourself and the academic work that you do. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, well, I'm Associate Chair of the Department of Religious Studies and uh, I've been at the University of South Florida for 35 years. Uh, going on 35 years, I think it's 30, 34 in a fraction. Wow. Um, I, and I, I love my work. And I just want to make a quick note about the relationship of the academic study of religion and the study of issues in food and yeah. culture generally. 
And very often, the understanding of what we do in religious studies is, well, misplaced. A lot of folks think that all we do is study traditional religions, what sure. I call the usual subjects, yeah. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, and the rest. Sure. But really what the study of religion is, is the study of culture systems, okay. the study of languages, the study of history, the study yeah. of the way in which cultures interact with one another, sure. the study of the sacred, and what are the forms of sacred legitimation within a culture. What do we value? What do we place meaning in? Well, at one level, and historically and traditionally, that might be the very well-known religions that we are so familiar with that we see all over the place. And yet the sacred takes many forms. And what we value and what we find meaningful is truly an expression of the sacred for us in our life and our experience. And it may be a traditional form of religion, but it might be something else as well. It might be something like politics. It might be something like uh, agrarianism. Sure. It might be something like experiences within popular culture. Yeah. My interest in the study of religion follows that route. Okay. Students, students colleagues, um, friends will say, well, well, what do you study? I say, well, I'm in the Department of Religious Studies, <clears throat> but what I study are manifestations of the sacred. What does it look like for a culture that, for example, embraces activities like consumerism, yeah. shopping, the acquisition of material goods at an incredible pace. To some degree, that could be argued that in our culture, that's a manifestation of the sacred. People find meaning and value in consumerist type activities. That's worth noting. People may find meaning, deep meaning and value in taking holidays, vacations, travels. Sure. That's where, that's where my interest is. That's what I'm interested in studying. That's what I'm interested in discovering because what I think is most critical for all of us to understand is what do we as individuals, but we as a culture, find most meaningful and most valuable? What are we willing to sacrifice for? Sure. What are we willing to put all of our energies into for the sake of enrichment and empowerment and for self-understanding? And that's what attracted me originally to the study of religion. Absolutely. It's because at one level, that's what religions have traditionally and historically done. But in our contemporary culture, that's changed. And what is sacred within our contemporary culture, in many respects, is not what has traditionally been seen as sacred and what, not what has traditionally been understood as religion. Thus, I'm not studying traditional religion as much as I'm studying manifestations of the sacred in contemporary culture. And that's really my entree into all of this. The, bulk of my research is over the course of my life and where I've done the greatest amount of my publishing is in the study of new religious movements. Okay. Groups that historically and traditionally have been labeled with derogatory terms uh, such as cults, yes. um, such as uh, predatory type uh, institutions, um, which attracted me originally because it suggested the way in which mainstream culture was viewing alternative religious expressions. And the way in which alternative religious expressions are viewed today in our culture is the way in which so many of the well-known religions of the past were viewed when they came on the scene. Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, so many of the well-known religions when they first emerged were seen as an anathema, were seen as countercultural, were seen as alien, yeah. were seen as dangerous with within the existing culture system. The connections and the similarities between the new religious movements of today and the historical religions of the past is so striking Absolutely. in that particular regard. Absolutely. So my study of new religious movements uh, brought me into the study of culture as a whole in terms of the novel, the new, and the forces that were bringing about change. That led to my study of uh, religion and popular culture and uh, I published a few books, but probably the most significant book that I've done in terms of uh, mainstream scholarship is a text called The Sacred Santa, The Religious Dimensions of Consumer Culture. It's still available on Amazon if you want to order it. <laughs> uh, and that was a, an analysis of the way in which our contemporary holidays, um, which are essentially rituals of acquisition and consumption, that there's always something that we have to buy for certain holidays. Sure. You know what you get at Valentine's Day. Right. Halloween is coming up, we know what we have to buy for Halloween. Right. Christmas is coming up, a huge bacchanal, a great blowout oh, of consumption. 
all of our holidays are tied in with rituals yeah. of consumption. That's the line of approach taken in that book. My study of religion and contemporary cultures then led me ultimately to the study of religion and ecology and religion and food systems. And that's what I've been working on for the last 10 years or so. Wonderful. Well, I'm very impressed by your scope of scholarly work and what you are doing. So I think just to kind of hone in, um, you were touching on food sovereignty. So, you know, I know we kind of had an informal discussion prior to this formal interview, but can you explain to us what food sovereignty is and what it means? Yeah, yeah, food sovereignty is the opportunity and the right of persons to determine their own food systems, which means the gardening, farming, the actual production of, of raw foods, and also the production processing of their own foods. To allow individuals as well as communities to have that opportunity and the right, the fundamental right, to make decisions about how they will acquire their, how they will produce their food, acquire their food, and share their foods with others. The movement for food sovereignty emerged several decades ago in the developing world, specifically yeah. in Mesoamerica and Central America, as we saw indigenous peoples, indigenous farmers that were literally dispossessed of their lands and their ability to produce their own food as a result of the encroachment of industrial agriculture. So the movement begins originally in the third world with the leading voice for food sovereignty in the developing world uh, via Campesina. And that was the first real social movement that addressed issues in food sovereignty. And it was done from the perspective of indigenous farmers that were now no longer able to farm, that were now no longer able to produce their own food as a result of industrial agriculture's penetration of those communities and also the cooperation of the government in support of the industrial food systems. This movement is still alive, still well. Uh, so back to the narrative. Uh, so the movement emerged in the third world and the developing world as an effort of peoples to really take control or reassert control over their own food production and their food choice. Okay. So that they may be able to choose what is appropriate for them and in their community, independent of control from large multinational corporations as well as their own government. Right. In more recent years, food sovereignty has grown and expanded uh, into issues that are relevant to the first world, specifically in the United States of America. The trajectory is not unlike the trajectory of liberation theology. Oh, okay. Liberation theology emerges originally in the developing world in Mesoamerica. Oscar Romero. Oscar Romero yes. is one of them, exactly right. You mentioned Romero, you could yeah. mention that Benino is another important um, uh, theologian, a great work on doing theology in a liberation, uh, doing theology in a revolutionary situation uh, with a work that always impressed me. But anyway, the liberation theology traveled north as well, it went from the global south to the global north, because many of the issues that uh, the marginalized, the dispossessed, the economically disadvantaged, and uh, uh, ethnic minorities um, in, in the global north, in the United States, are some of the very cha same challenges that folks were facing in the global south. Well, the issues with food sovereignty are not unlike that. The uh, indigenous peoples of Central America that were dispossessed of their land as a result of the, uh, the rise of industrial agriculture, sure. and then also the government cooperation with industrial culture. It's remarkable how similar those same challenges are to what farmers in North America face even to this very day with the powerful assertion of industrial agricultural ideals sure. over farming methods. Yeah. How should we farm? How should we grow food? Well, the dominant model, the form of sacred legitimation, if you will, sure. for farming in our country is to use industrial methods, yeah. which requires enormous amounts of fuel consumption, water consumption, sure. 
pesticides, fertilizers, all of these industrial needs to produce food at an enormous quantity right. are on the one hand destructive of local ecologies, but they are also destructive of local economies and they're ultimately destructive of local communities. Yes. So what happened, what was happening in Central America is happening also in North America. And there are many that recognize that challenge and recognize that the model of food sovereignty, which again is based on the principle of individuals having the opportunity and the right, and it's always important to include the idea of the right to produce their own food, process their own food, consume their own food and share their own food with others. That kind of right. network, which is a traditional agrarian network, which is kind of the network that, that has existed from the very beginning of agriculture. Yeah. That system is certainly under attack and is severely distressed in our culture today in, in the global north. Sure. You see it in terms of the, the decimation of farming communities of, around North America, around sure. the, the United States. But you also see it in the challenges that have existed until fairly recent times and still does exist in many parts of the United States. The, the challenge for individuals in urban environments to actually produce their own food. Food that is grown close to home in a local environment according to local seasons and local knowledge sure. is clearly superior to food that is produced through industrial methods and then ship in to urban environments. Yeah. If you think of a city, you have to imagine a city or a small town, even like this, you ask the question, and this is an agrarian question, I think we can introduce that yeah, term at this point absolutely. now. This is an agrarian question. Uh, agrarianism based on, on the principle of knowing and recognizing the sources of your existence and living accordingly. Knowing the sources of your existence and living accordingly. What are the sources of our existence? And this is a paraphrase, by the way, of uh, the great agrarian Wendell Berry. Sure. <clears throat> Berry uh, observed that for two generations, we, meaning USA culture, for two generations, we have lived with the costly luxury of living thoughtlessly about the sources of our existence. For two generations, we have lived with the costly luxury of living thoughtlessly about the sources of our existence. <clears throat> what are the sources of our existence? With the most basic level, the source of our existence is food, yeah. water, clothing, and community. Yes. Food, water, clothing, or you know, protection, um, and community. Yeah. And when he observes that we have for two generations, which means my generation and your generation, and we could probably add a third generation to that, either at the generation before mine or the generation coming after yours, that for these generations, two for the very maybe three today, we have not had to know the sorts of our existence. We have not had to know where our food comes from. What a privilege. It, it, and it, correct, well said, Mara. It is a privilege and Barry observes a costly privilege. Maybe we'll get to the cost in a moment. But we do not know where our food comes from. I ask my students in my class, where does your food come from? What's the source of your food? Sure. They'll say Publix, Walmart, yeah. um, uh, the Uber Eats delivery system, whatever it may be. So we don't know where our food comes from. We in terms of our sacred legitimation, in terms of the way in which we understand meaning and value and, and, and our participation, meaning and value in our yeah. culture, food comes from an outlet of the industrial food system, a grocery store, a fast food restaurant, a convenience store. That's where food comes from. Yeah. That's a fundamental error, a fundamental misunderstanding about the sources of our existence. The sources of our existence are actually some farm somewhere where that food was grown. Yeah. or um, uh, a, uh, a a meat packing plant, uh, a, a, a a large scale industrial operation in which the food was produced using industrial methods. Yeah. That food was then harvested, packaged, 
and then shipped somewhere else and to a distribution center. Then from that distribution center, typically with a brand name on it, which you can identify when you go to the store and look at all the brand names, from that distribution center, then that packaged food then is shipped to warehouses of a grocery chain or a food distribution system of some sort, and then shipped out to all the variety, all the various grocery uh, outlets that are associated with that particular unit. And, and I, could, I could go on yeah. in that regard, but suggesting the vast distance, both in time and space and quality of the food that we have today from the actual source, the origin of that food and its production. We don't know where the food was produced, and we don't care for the most part. Right. Now, increasingly, folks within USA culture are beginning to become aware of the problem that is present in that sort of system. And yet, nonetheless, for the most part, people will associate, for the most part, for the most part, people will associate the source of their food which is one of those elements uh, that Barry writes about in agrarianism, associate the source of their food with an outlet for the industrial food system. The same can be said of water. Where does the water come from? The classical answer that we'll get in our contemporary culture comes from the faucet. You turn on the faucet, right. there's the water. Okay, or even worse, if I may opine for a moment, even worse is water comes from a plastic bottle that I'm going to buy at a convenience store or that I'm going to buy at the grocery store, usually in packs of 24 yep. or 48 that themselves are packed further in plastic, yes. that's further complicating and complexifying the ecosystems that are being decimated by the plastic intrusion. Okay, so we don't know where the water comes from. Okay, then um, in, in terms of our clothing, a basic necessity of existence yeah. itself, where does your clothing come from? Well, when you ask someone, as I ask my students very often, what they'll do is, is they'll try to read the lapel, the, oh, the, yeah. the tag on the inside of their lapel to say, hey, well, it was made in, Bang in Bangladesh, it was made in India, it was made in China, yeah. in Vietnam, it was made in some other place than here. But we have no idea who made it, what the working conditions were for the people that made it, and yet we consume the material without a second thought because the consumption activity itself is the sacred activity. Yeah. So we don't know that. And then finally, the third element, which is the source of our existence, is community. Yes. Living together with one another, right. working with one another, building sound, stable community structures, sure. being able to laugh together, sing together, converse together, talk right. without the intrusion and the mediation of technological systems. As we consider our communities today, increasingly they're communities that are mediated by technology. No one goes anywhere except for me and a few others without a cell phone. Yeah. You've got to have the cell phone handy. And not only is the cell phone handy, but you're constantly using the cell phone. You can't, it seems that you can't exist without the cell phone. And then so the cell phone or the computer perhaps becomes the instrument of building communities as opposed to sitting and talking with people and enjoying a face-to-face -face conversation in which you can observe the reactions of the person that you're chatting with, that you can engage in a deeper kind of reflection sure. on an ongoing basis, and maybe not just two people, but maybe three or four or five right. people, or a small community that gathers together to chat, to converse, to discuss the world around them, yeah. to find out that there's some real differences in their understanding of the world, but they have a chance to work it out, rather than sending out a tweet blast and attack someone that's different than you, you get to sit down with someone that may have a different view than you and maybe discuss it and reach some sort of resolution and move forward with the community. So Barry says we've lived two generations, I would say three generations, yeah. with the costly luxury of living thoughtlessly about the sources of our existence. Why is that so costly? It's costly at one level because the that experience, not only the food comes from water, where the water comes from, the clothing comes from earth, the break of community has cost someone something, somewhere. It's cost the worker that is being exploited to harvest the food for you. Yeah. It's cost the environment that's being wrecked in order to get the water out of the uh, diminishing aquifer. It cost the laborer in Bangladesh or Pakistan 
perhaps even their life in order to produce the food that we wear, the shoes that we have on our feet. And it's costly because it witnesses the breakup of our community and the true deep resources of our humanness. We see all of those elements going on. There's a cost there. And here's the point about the cost. Someone has paid that cost. Who has paid the cost? So that my generation, the one behind me, the one before me, yeah. can live thoughtlessly without about the source of our existence. Who's paid the generate who's paid the cost are previous generations. My father, my grandfather, my great grandfather. Yeah. Those elders that came before us who worked hard and in a disciplined manner yeah. and had to, and had to know the sources of their existence Absolutely. and did know the sources of their existence and did everything that they possibly could to survive and perhaps make a better world for the generation that followed them. They paid an incredible cost yeah. for that so that I yes. they don't have to do it. Who else pays the cost? The generations that will follow us are going to pay the oh, cost are going to pay the cost for this costly luxury we, we have to live thoughtlessly about the sources of our existence. Our children and our grandchildren are going to pay the cost as they live in a polluted and a dissipating world, a world in which our animal companions are dis disappearing at an alarming rate. We may be living in the midst of the sixth mass extinction of the planet. That's a result of our costly luxury of living thoughtlessly about the sources of our existence. They will also pay the cost of living in a world in which the climate is m much more inhospitable to human life than it is right now. Yeah. As challenging as it may seem, sitting in Florida at the end of September when it's 93 sure. degrees outside, they will also pay the cost in the breakdown of the community structures that are going to be necessary to rebuild and reconstruct the world. The generations before have paid a terrible price, the generations after have paid a terrible price and the developing world, sometimes called the third world, is paying a terrible price for our ability in the United States of America and other places to live thoughtlessly about the source of our existence. And finally, who else is paying the price? The entire ecology, the entire ecosystem, which is showing signs of stress and dismemberment right now. So, agrarianism says, you should know the sources of your existence and live accordingly. So if you do, if you seek to really discover the sources of your existence, you will discover that those sources are for the most part far away and unknown. Once you get to that point where it's important to know the sources of your existence, then there's an opening, there's an opportunity for creative change. Sometimes it takes only a tiny hinge to move a heavy door. Yeah. The tiny hinge could be the realization of the significance of the agrarian vision. Yeah. The vision that says to know the sources of your existence. Yeah. Once that becomes important, then what may happen is you will seek out local opportunities for food production. Sure. You may even work to grow your own food or find a local farmer who's producing food or go to a local farmer's market that's genuinely local with yeah. farmers from around the area where you live and acquire the food from those people. That's a way of supporting an agrarian vision and beginning to turn the page, beginning to change the narrative just a bit. If you do it, that's wonderful. If you can encourage others to do it, that's even more wonderful. But most critically of all, be in a position to be able to change public policy on such issues, to encourage your municipalities, your counties, state, even the national government to begin to divert some of the resources away from industrial agriculture, away from massive building and construction projects, away from tax breaks and free meals that are given to construction enterprises, to the industrial food system, to various enterprises that in one way are consuming the material and natural world, to perhaps divert just a fraction of that to local enterprises that one seek to build up the local economies, the local ecologies, and the local food systems. Just a tiny fraction of the amount of money that's being spent to encourage more building, more industrial agriculture, more scientific experimentation with plants and animals. A tiny fraction of that money, if just a tiny fraction of that money was diverted to actually stimulating local agrarian projects, the transformation would be remarkable. Absolutely. So one of my initial thoughts prior to us meeting, I was, you know, really curious because 
you are a scholar in religious studies and you're also doing work in food sovereignty and I was really intrigued to see, you know, where are the correlations and the intersections between religion and food? And you really touched on many of these yeah, nuances. Yeah, kind of broadly. Uh, I'll go back again to the way I approach the study of religion. Yeah. Um, and it's the study of uh, manifestations of sacred legitimation. Right. So yeah. what do we value? What do we put our greatest value in? What identifies us? What tells us about our world? What are the myths and the rituals that are most important to us within a particular culture system? And uh, that, uh, for various reasons, led me, first of all, to the study of new religious movements, then uh, the study of popular culture in general and contemporary cultures in a broad sense, and then eventually the issues in ecology. And in each of those manifestations, in each of those moments of research, what I was finding, what I was following, the, the, the thread I was following, this, the stream that I was following, was manifestations of the sacred. Whether it be a new religious movement, yeah. in which individuals that are involved in the new religious movement that's somehow different from mainstream religion, you follow the new religious movement, and you discover that for the people that are in that movement, there's something meaningful and valuable yeah. and important to them that identifies them and identifies the culture that they're part of. I study this, then moving into the study of religion and popular culture, another manifestation of, of the sacred is things like uh, uh, sporting events, um, media, um, um, mass uh, music festivals, um, politics, government, activities that relate us to uh, the state, um, consumerism, buying things, um, logo t-shirts, um, the uh, little fish appliques that you see on the back of cars. Oh, yeah. The manifestation yeah. of popular culture. That's religion in popular culture. Right. Another yeah. manifestation. Another manifestation of fish applique. You don't know what the fish you see the fish applique and you don't know what it is. And so people say, what's that fish applique about? Well, people that are in the Christian religious community might recognize what the fish is, but others wouldn't. So then the fish applique morphed into a fish applique that had Jesus written inside of the fish. Yeah. Just so people would know. So right. you turned a symbol into something like a sign. It's like branding. Yeah, it is, it is. It is branding, but it was a, it was not an effective brand at first because people didn't know what the fish was. So now we had to put Jesus Concept. inside the fish, yeah. like the fish had eaten the Jesus yeah. word. And I'm thinking, if you really wanted to make some money at that, you could take that fish applique and put Jonah inside of the fish, and then you'd not, then you'd have some fun. But anyway, that so the study of manifestation of the sacred took me in the direction of new religious movements, then the study of popular culture, especially consumer culture, and then eventually the study of uh, ecology in a broad general sense specifically food systems yeah. as they relate to uh, as they relate to ecology. So I'd say that the key relationship is the concept of the sacred and how that manifests within the society that we are part of. Absolutely. Uh, so that's a connection, but perhaps in a more uh, classical sense of understanding religion, if you think about religion at all, the religions that you may know or participate in in some way, uh, or that you've read about or you've seen uh, movies about that religion from the very beginning has been about food. Part of all religious traditions is food consumption. Some traditions are especially explicit about the importance of diet in living a proper religious life. So I won't go into great detail about that, but even religious systems that may not be particularly uh, focused on particular dietary issues, even religions that are not like that, still nonetheless have expected uh, 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 foods that are consumed in the context of their religion. Yeah. Even a, the largest religion in the world, Christianity, which in some respects may not seem to have dietary uh, uh, restrictions or may not seem to have uh, particular food issues, in most forms of, of Christianity, there's a ritual meal that's consumed sure. as a natural part of the religious experience, and that's the, the what's sometimes called the Lord's Supper yeah. or communion, in which there's a meal that's taken. Yes. It's a symbolic meal, but it's a meal that nonetheless is taken. And then you have various religious systems that stress vegetarianism, yes. so that you don't harm animals. There's a, other religions that will uh, 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 put a focus on periods of ritual fasting during during the during the year. Uh, and then there's special foods that are eaten at certain times. So in terms of even of traditional religion, food has been a major part of religion from the very, very beginning. And, and just as a, like a closing thought about that is religious traditions typically in 
one way or another will perform some sort of religious ritual in the context of their actual food consumption. Uh, in the West, that term is often referred to as grace. You will say grace before the meal yes. in which you are giving thanks for the food that you are about to consume. Yes. Those traditional models, and just to return to the traditional models for a moment, those traditional models themselves are under assault as a result of the industrial food system and the way in which we begin to think about food. It's difficult to give great thanks and say grace when you're stopping in at the fast food restaurant and getting a burger to go, or some fries, or a right. milkshake, or you go to the convenience store and you buy uh, some of those little uh, chocolatey cakes uh, just to grab something to eat, yeah. or a bag of peanuts from who knows where. The relationship of a Thanksgiving or a grace for that food so elemental for the great sweep of human history in terms of religion is all but forgotten today. That we live not only in a, in a fast food nation, but in a nation that's been colonized by the industrial food system. So traditional models of relationship with food in terms of religion are gone, but the very understanding of food in a sacred sense is, has all but disappeared for large segments of the population. Now, that's changing. Yeah. And there are signs of it changing, okay. such as the project that we're working on. In our little town of Newport Ritchie, uh, we have a local uh, sustainable movement called FarmNet, which is an effort to bring together the local farmers, together with local markets, together with local restaurants. The restaurants we're sitting at right now, Rose's Bistro, Rose's Bistro off Main, uh, uses, <laughs> uses food from our community gardens. Uh, we have farm-to-table dinners that are here. Those are signs of a right. change that's beginning to occur. Sure. Wright's Market, right down the street, we are at Wright's Market earlier yeah. today. We dropped off about uh, 10 pounds of locally harvested sweet potatoes. Uh, just came out of the ground about two weeks ago. They were kind of curing for a little bit. That's beginning to change the way in which people think about food. Increasingly, people will go to a place like Wright's Market and say, what do you have that's local? I want to get the local food that's in season right now. People come to Rose's Bistro and say, um, what do you have on the menu from the local farmers? These are small signs of change, but if you think back even 10 years, those sorts of experiences did not exist. Yeah. There weren't local outlets for local food producers. There weren't farm-to-table events. There wasn't a place like Rose's Bistro that made a commitment to buying local food so they could serve it. I can mention another wonderful place, the West Side Deli that is working with sweet potato leaves, as a matter of fact. Wow. We mentioned that earlier. A wonderful source of nourishment that can grow all summer long. Well, all of this is part of a change that's beginning to happen. And as I said before, the, the metaphor, the analogy that I use is the small hinge. It's a small hinge that can move a great door. Sure. But you need to get those hinges in place. You need to begin doing that work. Sure. And that's what we're trying to do with work locally like the organization called FarmNet. And then at the University of South Florida, the Urban Food Sovereignty Group which is the group that's sponsoring the event on October 22nd. I don't know if, that's, if this is gonna show in the context of that. Oh, it will. <laughs> but but in, uh, on October 22nd at 5.30 at the Alumni Center at University of South Florida, we're gonna have a, uh, an Urban Food Sovereignty Summit, which is going to bring together local growers, local farmers, um, folks like Mara and the Funky Spork, <laughs> uh, folks like the FarmNet, some, uh, some of the local organizations that are working to support farmers in their areas. We're going to have the Guadalupe Roastery, which is a local organization that is committed to acquiring fair trade coffee beans direct from the farmers in Central America to make them available here. Now, I won't go into detail. There'll be a lot of represented, a lot of representation there. But those are the small hinges. This is the beginning of the change that can become a massive transformation of culture. And it does begin in small ways and it does begin with individuals, but it's important to do what we can as individuals, certainly make a difference in our own life, but also move to tell others about the importance of these kinds of work to the degree that we possibly can, also to involve larger institutions, especially the institutions of government, to get on board with these sorts of changes and work to share those changes with the broader community. Beautifully stated. So you were talking about, um, and I was going to touch on that, but I'm glad you did, the um, USF Food Sovereignty Summit. Um, now my question is, um, so that's hosted by the USF Food Interest Group, which is a collective... Well, well it's, it's hosted by, well, it's hosted by the Department of Religious Studies. I want to okay. make that very okay. clear. Because I, I, it's important to recognize that 
the humanities and sure. religious studies in particular yeah. has much to contribute to the understanding of issues in our food system. Sure. Typically understanding of the food system, analysis of the food system comes from areas such as public administration, yes. such as um, uh, public health, yes. uh, such as the social sciences. Yes. What's often left out of the reflection, what's left out of the discussion are the humanities. Yeah. And yet those are the very, that's the very area yes. that brings to the fore critical questions about the nature of our culture itself. Yes. This is not the downstream issues, but the upstream issues in challenges that our, that our culture faced. It's not dealing with the problems as we see them now. Yes. It's looking back to find what the sources of the problems are. So rather than, for example, uh, being interested in uh, food security, sure. which is an important concern, don't get me wrong. Yes. We can solve food security in the context of the existing industrial food system. Yes. We just pour the waste food from the industrial yes. food system into all the different food banks and the community organizations that are working to get food to people that are hungry. That's great. It's a stopgap measure. It won't eliminate the challenge. If we go upstream from that, we might ask the question is this, why do we have food insecurity in the first place? What is it about this particular culture system, the richest culture that the world has ever seen, the, the most powerful material culture the world has ever seen, and a culture system that is able to produce a cornucopia of food like the, the earth has never produced yes. in, in history? Why is it that we have food insecurity at the rate that we have that's as high or higher than it has been since we began pouring billions of dollars into trying to solve the problem and uh, gigatons of waste food into various food feeding operations. It's again, the model that we're working with in that is a model that sacrifices industrial food production and overproduction of food and overconsumption of food, which ends up with large amounts of waste food, but also correspondingly, because of the same forces that are at work in the industrial food system, are at work throughout the entire industrial system of the West and the United States. Those same forces are what produces food insecurity in people that are impoverished and can't afford to buy food. Why don't we get back of the effort to just cut keep pouring more and more waste food into the food uh, feeding operation. Why don't we get back at that and say, why don't we divert some of the energy, part of the resource, some of the uh, interests in just feeding people and get back of it and see if we can get to the production end of it. And yeah. say, what can we do both locally, uh, regionally, statewide, uh, nationally, to begin to create the opportunities and the right for folks to grow their own food. If that's done, then you begin solving the problem at the source rather than trying to rectify a challenging situation at the downstream uh, with the downstream effects of it. Well, absolutely. So that you know that that's part of the argument, that's part of the part of the case that would be made. Yes, I, I really agree. So um, for those of you folks that live in the Tampa Bay area or even the Tampa Bay region that are really interested in learning more about food systems and you want to meet some of the folks that are really involved within this movement, I really would like to encourage you to attend the USF Food Sovereignty Summit that will once again be occurring on October 27th. Yeah, second starts at 5.30. 5.30 p.m. And is that uh, free or open to yeah, the public? Yeah, free and open to the public. Wonderful, wonderful. Yep, everybody can come. Uh, yes, exactly right. Uh, October 22nd, Tuesday, 5.30, Alumni Center. Um, and it's the Urban Food Sovereignty Conference. And to get back to what we said, it's hosted by the Department of Religious Studies sure. and the Urban Food Sovereignty Group at USF. Wonderful. Which is a collection of scholars that study food sovereignty, but also members of the community, activists within the community sure. that are working in food sovereignty, including uh, uh, farmers, uh, gardeners, a network of community gardens, everyone that is involved in food sovereignty in the Tampa Bay Everyone that's involved in food sovereignty in the, in the Tampa Bay area is encouraged, welcome, cordially invited to come to the to the event. But also, please get involved with the USF Urban Food Sovereignty Group itself, okay. because that's going to be the long-term yes. project that's going to do more projects of this sort and work to be a platform sure. where this material, where these issues can be studied, but also where action can perhaps be taken Absolutely. in a public sense. Okay, so my question is, if maybe you're not able to attend this summit, because 
I'm sure a lot of people will not be able to, but they would love to. Right. How can people find out about the USF um, Food Sovereignty Group? Okay, the, the probably the easiest, quickest way is there's a website okay. for the uh, uh, USF Urban Food Sovereignty Group, and you can go to the website and get information on that. Okay, and I'll post the link below. Yes, and if if you go to the Funky Spork yes. website, right? There she is. Funky Spork website. There will be contact information yes, or there a link that you can pick up there yes. at that point. Um, there's a number of individuals that are involved in it. Um, the, the best thing would be to try to make it to the event, of course, because that's where you're going to get all the information on the contact. Short of that, go to the Funky Sport. You can also get information on it from, do you have that literature that I gave you about the farm net? Oh, yes. Um, we, there's a Facebook page. There you go. There you go, thanks a lot. There's a Facebook page for, and this is just an organization that I'm closely familiar with that I know will get reaction to. It's an organization called the Newport Ritchie Farm Net which is one of these local agrarian projects that has a, f a Facebook page and you should be able to find it through just going to the Facebook page and you can just ask at the Facebook page and send a message to the administrator and say, hey, I heard about the Food Sovereignty Conference. I'd like to be more involved in the food, the Urban Food Sovereignty Group itself. If you just go to that Facebook page, you'll, you'll get a contact there that can go forward uh, and uh, get in contact with us there. Uh, you can you can contact me at the University of South Florida. My name is Deshaunt, D-E-C-H-A-N-T, at usf dot edu. Deshaunt at usf dot edu, and you can communicate with me there, and I can put you on the mailing list, I can put you on the email list. So there's a variety of ways of getting involved. And it's a, it's a developing organization, and in many respects, it's a, it's a very unique kind of organization because it's bringing together scholars at USF that work in sovereignty, together with persons in the community that are engaged in sovereignty, as well as activists that are working to affect change within the culture to create greater opportunities for some food sovereignty in our media community. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been a wonderful discussion, folks. I'm going to have all the contact information listed below this video and I'll have a subsequent post to complement this video but um, once again I'll have all the information here I hope to see some of you uh, next Tuesday at the Food Sovereignty Summit otherwise um, we'll catch up soon have a great afternoon